Today, I would like to share with you um, what I have learned by creating full stack reactive projects using Spring Web Flux, uh, which is part of Spring Boot 2 or Spring 5 um, on the back end with Java, and also uh, Angular in the front end. So we have a complete full stack application using all the goodness of reactive programming. So the agenda for today, uh, first I would like to share with you uh, a few thoughts about why reactive, um, and as you know, um, can you please raise your hand if you have worked with Spring before? Okay, that's great. So why should we choose the Spring Reactive instead of Spring MVC, for example? Um, and also, I'll go into a little bit more detail, share some code snippets with you for the Reactive backend with Spring, and then we'll dive a little bit into Angular as well, Reactive Programming with Angular. And then just to go the next and extra step, we'll also see state management uh, in Angular, which is also the Redux uh, flow. And then just present a little demo for you, and of course, uh, at the end of the session, if you like it at home or later, uh, take a look at the source code as well. So just to get started, this is the tech stack that we're gonna use. Um, we're gonna use Spring, Spring 5 or Spring Boot, um, MongoDB, um, I like MongoDB as well, but in case you like to use Oracle or any other uh, database, it's also possible. I'll talk a little bit about that later as well. Um, RxJS, uh, which is what provides all the reactive programming in Angular. If you're familiar with RxJava, it's basically very similar, the same thing, but Java and JavaScript, and also Angular. I chose Angular because it's the framework that I'm most familiar with, but in case you like to use React or Vue, that's also fine. You can achieve the same results. Uh, the latest one, you can use five, six, uh, seven, eight is around the corner, it's still in beta. Um, yeah, seven. Seven is the latest stable one. But you can apply if you're still using uh, Angular version five or six, or even version eight, you'll also be able to use all of this. So just to give a little bit of more an overview of the overall of the stack, MongoDB will work as, as our data source for our API. Then we're gonna use Spring Web Flux. We have the repository, the reactive repository that we're gonna use as part of the Spring API. We also have the controller. Um, if you like functional programming in Spring 5, there's also the routes that you can use. I still prefer to use controllers, but it's just a matter of personal, uh, personal preference. And then we'll go into the react, reactive Angular, and we're gonna learn, uh, we're gonna use a lot of observables in our XJS as well, so we can have um, our single source of data, which is the Redux way that we have in Angular, uh, React, or Vue, or any other framework you like to use. So let's start with Spring. So, I'm sorry? Correct. <laughs> so Spring, um, we're gonna use Spring Reactive, which is the latest version, version five, as I mentioned before. This is a nice infographic that I like to use, especially when uh, we have to justify why we're using reactive programming, especially on the, the back end, a reactive design, not only programming, but also a design. So this is from 2017, and I'm sure these numbers have increased um, uh, uh, for this year, 2019. So for example, uh, for iMessages, we have 16 million messages being exchanged every minute. Uh, in Facebook, 900,000 logins. In Netflix, we have also on the thousands hours watched. But if you take a look at this, uh, for example, uh, Netflix or YouTube or even Spotify, uh, these are more streaming music and videos. But usually in our application, especially if you work in enterprise applications, um, we have data, we have lots of data. And if you are a Java developer, at some point in your career, you created one object, you mapped with JPA or Hibernate, and you mapped all the other tables that had a relationship and basically loading the entire database at once. 
which is of course, it's not good and that's what we wanna change. We wanna send information as quickly as we can to the user so the user can see something, can consume some data, and then we'll send more data as the client can consume. And this is a paradigm shift, so we have to change the way that we think of coding applications today. We're so used of thinking uh, synchronously when we are coding, uh, especially on the back end with, with Java or any other language. We already have Ajax calls from the client from a front end to the back end, which are asynchronous, but when we are coding in, in Java and Spring MVC, for example, we're still coding synchronously. And we wanna change that to be asynchronous as well. So when our client is evoking the API asynchronously, we also want all the code in the backend to be asynchronous. And that's the key for us to change the way that we think and start coding asynchronously. So it's all about reactive programming. So what is reactive programming? Only in a single word we can describe, and it's all about streams. So a stream is basically a flow of continuous data. We're always receiving data nonstop. And to do that, um, we use a very famous pattern that we have, which is the publisher and the subscriber. So the publisher will be the source of the data, so someone will be sending on the data, and then we have the subscriber that will be consuming the data. And the way that we'll um, exchange this information is through streams. So imagine your favorite YouTube channel. So you like that channel so much that you click on the subscribe button and then you don't have to hit refresh. Did this person publish a new video? So you're gonna be notified every time the, the channel, the, there, there is a new video on the channel. So you don't have to hit the refresh button every time. So it's kind of a little bit similar, but with data. There is a, a source, and then we're gonna subscribe to the source, and we're gonna be notified whenever there is, there is new data for us to consume. And going back to uh, Spring 5, we have our loved MVC that we, we use a lot since the beginning of the times of, of, of Spring. So we have the MVC, uh, and the MVC is based on the servlet API, and of course we also have a servlet container, and then we can use the annotations that we love, such as controller, uh, request mapping, post, get, boot, lead, all the restful um, things that we have available. But there is one thing that, if, especially if you have an application that you need to scale up and you have so many requests, it becomes a little bit difficult if you need to scale this application. Because for, you're gonna have a, a servlet for, for, every, um, for every request, and that's really bad, especially if you need to, to scale it up. Now imagine that your application is receiving, we don't have to go to the millions, 500 requests per second. There is a lot, and again, it's gonna become a little bit expensive to scale this application up. But when we work with Spring Web Flux, we're not working with servlets, we're working with event loop. So it's gonna give us um, that uh, idea of we can run more requests without compromising our application so much. So it makes much easier to scale our applications. And of course, uh, when we work with Spring Web Flux, we're gonna work with streams to exchange the data. And then we have also uh, new uh, servers that will run, especially for example, we have the Jetty and Netty they are that um, support asynchronous operations. And uh, if you do like reactive programming, you can use uh, router functions. There, there is also a new way for you to expose your API. Or if you like it, you can still use controllers uh, and all the annotations from Spring MVC as well. The major difference is it's all about the data that we're gonna uh, send or uh, as a source we're gonna publish uh, to the subscriber. So in case um, for the repository, what we have here, instead of optional of uh, a list of objects or single objects, we have the mono for a single object, and we have the flux for multiple objects. So as you can see, the return of all of these methods for the insert, uh, find, update, delete, and whatnot, it's the flux 
or the mono, depending on the, the results. So for one object, it's very simple. The publisher will only stream a single object, and then it's gonna finalize, it's gonna complete. But when we have multiple objects, the source will be able to stream multiple objects. So it's a continuous, um, continuously stream of data. And of course, uh, if there is any, for any reason, you can also terminate that stream at any time that it's required. Okay, enough talking. Let's see a little bit of action. Um, so I have this application. We are at a Java conference, Oracle, so uh, coffee, great. So we have a simple e-commerce for uh, coffee that the front end is in Angular and the back end is powered by Spring Web Flux with uh, all the reactive streams. So this is also running on Oracle Cloud uh, with Docker. I'll leave the code and the Docker files everything later for you if you like to download it and test it at home as well. So just to show you what we have here, it's a very, oops, no. It's a very um, simple API that is returning uh, coffees. So with the description, the price, if there is any discount as well, uh, the image. And then we also have the simple e-commerce. You can search, um, there, you can also add your coffee to the cart. I really like coffee, I want more coffee. So you add in your coffees and then you can do the checkout as well. And this is also consuming the data from the API. So they're running in different ports and we have engine uh, inks as well doing the proxy so we don't have to use cores as well. So if we go to the network and if I refresh, we can see where is the call to the backend. Let me see right here. So we have the products that is getting from the, the URL that I showed you before. So this is very simple. How we can uh, write a very simple application such as this one. So first things first, we're gonna start with the model. So this is the, uh, what we see in the JSON that is being exposed uh, in the API. We also have Longbox. If you want to use Kotlin, you can also use Kotlin. It's also supported. I like Longbox. I still like Java for some reason, but what can I do? So we have all the annotations for the generate the constructions with, um, with the arguments, no arguments, generate the getter setters, to string, all that boring stuff that we usually ask the IDE to do that for us. But we can do that with uh, annotations with Longbox. Then we have all the uh, properties that we have in our collection, which is products. Next, we have the report story. So of course, um, we'll have the products and the, the string, and we're gonna use not the CRUD repository or the JPA, or, uh, but we're gonna use the reactive Mongo repository, which is also part of Spring Data, and already has all the, the, the code that we need to be able to connect asynchronously to MongoDB, and that's the key word. We wanna connect in a, in, in a synchronous way with the database. And when this was released at first, only MongoDB was supported because only non-relational databases had asynchronous drivers. But now there is a um, project as well that I'll show you uh, at the end of the session that you can also use to connect asynchronously with relational databases as well. So with this, we're gonna have all the, um, all the methods for our CRUD operations, create, read, delete, update, find, find by ID, find by uh, property and whatnot. And then we have a controller. Of course, if you like to, you can also create a service so you can have your business logics. Um, since this is a very simple example, I'm connecting the repository directly in the controller just to make our lives easier. So uh, as you can see, I'm still using the REST controller request mapping. I like to use uh, these annotations, but you can also use the router functions if you like. And then we have repository, and we're also doing the dependency injection through the constructor. Uh, if you like to, you can also use the auto wire uh, annotation, um, but it's no longer a best practice since three years ago. If you use IntelliJ IDEA to code, for example, IntelliJ will tell you use the dependency injection through the uh, to, through the constructor. And then if you take a look at the methods, uh, so far so good, everyone's okay with the code? 
Okay, so for the controller, the get, you can do uh, post, put, delete as well. And one thing to notice here, so we have repository find all, and then we have find by ID, then we can do a little bit of uh, functional programming as well. We're gonna map um, the product into a response entity, and then if um, it's not found, we can also return a not found as well. But one thing to notice here again is the type of the return of the method, which is flux and not a single, um, and not a, a list of product, but uh, flux for multiple objects and mono for a single object. So instead of returning a response entity of product, I'm returning a mono, which is a single object. Instead of returning a list of products, just returning a flux, which is gonna stream um, just the, all the list. So if we take a look and we try to compare the reactive way with the MVC way, you can see there is very similar. The only difference here is on the signature and the return type of the method. So flux and list, and that's basically it. And of course, uh, when we have all these methods, we're gonna have streams, so you can use all the operators to manage your information as well. But basically, that's that. So if you wanna start using Reactive Spring today, you can, you can le leverage all the knowledge that you have uh, by working with Spring MVC and start using the reactive way, which is so much fun. Um, so here, again, another example. So this is the get by ID or find by ID. Uh, I change my mind all the time, so two, same methods, different names. So for, again, for the reactive way, we have a mono of response entity of one single product, and uh, for the MVC, we have just the rep response entity with the single, um, the single object as well. And if you take a look, we're also calling the find by ID, and one it's using the GPA repository, the other one is using the reactive MongoDB repository, and that's basically the same thing. We do a map, default if empty, the only difference is gonna be in the MVC, we do the or else, because we have an optional, uh, the, the repository interface returns an optional instead of a, um, a mono. Okay, this is great for CRUDs, but should we, use, should we use reactive programming for CRUDs? It depends on the application. If you have a lot of requests, why not? Um, but what if we have um, real world, which is great, which is what we, we work for a living, right? Um, so for example, imagine a more complex e-commerce and you have all your orders and for the orders, you need to get the products that belongs to that order, and for each of the products, Amazon, for example, where you buy three things and they are shipped uh, independently, so they're not shipped in a single package. And you can get the shipping status for each of the product in your order. Um, so we can have these methods um, if we are working an MVC way, but if we wanna use the reactive way, we can get everything and we can work through the operators using the flat map, a switch map, any other uh, Rx uh, Java uh, operator that we need to use to manage our data. So we can, we can use all the reactive operators, manage the data, and this is gonna be a stream. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is gonna be uh, returned in a single object to the client. Whenever there is information available, it's gonna send directly to the client. So that's a more complex exam example that we have as well. There is one important thing that we need to keep in mind whenever we are working with uh, reactive um, a, re a reactive backend, which is called the back pressure. What is it? It doesn't matter if you have a very powerful server that is able to transfer gigs of data if your client is not able to consume that. Now imagine that you have like a YouTube or a Netflix video or, or um, Spotify uh, song, for example, and then if you don't have 4G or 5G available, you're still using 3G or even 2G in your phone. So you're not, even though they have powerful servers that are able to transfer lots of data, you are not able to consume all the data. So we also need to make sure that the client can get all the information that we are transferring to, that we are streaming to it. And this is called back pressure. So 
basically when we are working with streams, and this is very important, when without streaming, we are just sending all the data that we have. With streamings, we can send bits of it. And then as, as long as the client is able to consume, the client will tell you, hey, I'm able to uh, get even more data, hit me, send me. And then your server will understand and will be able to transfer that information as well. So it's gonna be a more, um, um, the, the client and your, your subscriber and your publisher will be more in sync. So for that demo, let me change here again. Um, so we have here all the, the coffees. Let me add some orders again and let me clean this and then I'll do the checkout. So I'm gonna just request my order. Now imagine that you are at a coffee shop so you can get all the information um, in your mobile order or something like that. So we have a stream right here, and as you can see, we have received the order, and then they are really good, they are really fast preparing coffee. So order received, order confirmed, they're preparing the order now, so it's being prepared, we're getting the information here as well, and then next, it has been delivered. So that's it, and notice that here, we're receiving different messages. So this is called, uh, this, this format, and this is, was a stream that we called even streaming as well. Um, so this format that you can see here on the bottom is called the NJSON or the new line, the limited uh, JSON. So instead of receiving information on this format, which is the one that we are used to, uh, we have an array and we have all the objects, each time, for each, um, for each time that the publisher is sending information, it's gonna send one object at a time, so it's one JSON. Okay. So how do we handle this type of back pressure? How do we prepare our application for uh, back pressure? So as you can see here, we're gonna send a new media type. So instead of sending a JSON, we're gonna send a stream of, of values and um, Spring will be able to prepare all the format for you automatically. And uh, we're still gonna use here a flux of orders. So it's still a list of order, a list of status. And we have a find all and this is just to try to emulate each stream, each event that is happening on the order status. Good with Spring? Okay. Okay, so we have developed our uh, simple application with Spring and now it's time to go to the, to the client. Of course, this can be a microservice and you have another microservice consuming that as well, uh, but I love to integrate different technologies and uh, what I love to do, and I love to work with Java and uh, JavaScript as well, especially with Angular. So Angular by default is already a reactive framework and the reactive programming is present in Angular in the HTTP, so we can do all the AJAX requests that we have. That's, we, are, uh, we are gonna use the reactive way. The router, so you have a single page application and you're changing the pages, you're changing your uh, router address, it's also treated as a reactive. We also have the authorization guard, so if a user is able to access a particular uh, route in your application, it's also reactive. And also the forms, and this is one of my favorite parts of Angular. So it has a really good API and all the forms. You can also, um, you can also subscribe to value changes instead of having that change event that you have in JavaScript to listen to any changes that happens in, in the input property, an input text, for example. So in Angular, when we work with our XJS, it's very similar when we are working with our XJava, and it's very similar the way that Spring Web Flux works. So we also have a publisher. In this case, we're gonna call it observable, so we are able to observe that object in Angular. 
which is gonna work as our data source. And of course, Angular will be able to uh, do a, an Ajax request for our Spring Web Flux API, so it's able to get the information. We can also use all the operators, map, flat map, switch map, merge map, there's a lot of map. Um, but you can also do uh, ma many other operators uh, to, to manage your data and transform the data and return exactly as you need uh, in, your, in your screen, in your UI. And of course, we also have the observer, which is gonna be that uh, the consumer, the person that is, um, the, not the person, the object that is listening to all the, 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 the subscriber that is listening to all the, the streams that are gonna be transferred. Okay, so just a snippet on how we can consume data from, um, from Spring using Angular and this is beautiful. I think this code, it's like, it's very simple and elegant and beautiful. Uh, so for example, if you wanna get all the information, all, all the orders or the products that we have in, a, in our Spring API, and it doesn't matter, for this particular example, it doesn't matter if you're using MVC or uh, Spring Web Flux, it's gonna be in a very similar way. So we have the get, so Angular already provides in an object for us to make all the requests. We, all we have to do is pass the URL, and, uh, which is the API, and then we're also gonna get a return. So as you can see here, we also have generics are available, and this is uh, because of TypeScript. TypeScript is like a cousin of C Sharp, C Sharp and Java, a very similar and syntax way, so we're home. You can leverage all your knowledge as well working uh, with code like this. And then we're also gonna manage the data. The take is because we're gonna go to the server, we're only gonna get it once. If you like to work with streams, you don't use the take, you just use without the take, and then we're just gonna cache the data. And the same thing for the create. We do a post, we can also do a put for updates, and we can also uh, remove, but very straightforward code. Sure. It's part of RxJS. Um, since RxJS 6, um, because in, in Java, for example, when, whenever you have a stream and you wanna use the operators, you just do a dot and you use the operator. In um, RxJS, uh, you have to use the pipe just to notify RxJS that you are gonna use all the operators inside the pipe. So it's kind of um, going back to that previous, uh, you have the publisher, you kind of have the pipe, which is gonna, uh, you're gonna use to transform the data and you're gonna be able to use any operators that you need. And then you're gonna have your uh, consumer, which is gonna subscribe to this observable or to this publish later. All the, the, the return types for all of these um, methods are observable, so they are publishers and you'll be able to Yes, yes. That's just a different way uh, just to make sure. So yeah, the pipe is where I'm doing all the transformation uh, or uh, transforming the data into what I really need to receive. And of course the tap is just, um, it's like a void and, and you can use for a console log. It's like a system out um, some sort. Uh, or you can use uh, to cache. So this is just a simple assign assignment. I'm not actually doing anything with the data, I'm just caching it. Okay? So, and that was how we handle Ajax requests. And I, as I said, again, it doesn't matter if you're using uh, Spring Reactive or if you're using Spring MVC, it's gonna be in a similar way. The only difference is that if you're using Spring Reactive, you're not gonna have the take, but if you're using a, simpler, uh, a simple Ajax request for Spring MVC, you just, you leave the take one. Uh, and how do we handle pressure uh, with, back pressure with RxJS? And this comes, and, and um, there is an API called Even Source, and this is not related to Angular itself or React or Vue or, or even RxJS. It's just an API that is available as part of the HTML5 uh, API. There is also another one that is called Stream. You can use uh, Stream as well if you like, but Stream has a lot of more code, and I personally prefer to use the Even Source because the code is a little bit simpler. So you're gonna create an event source. Um, you're gonna add, 
you're going to listen to that source, which is, in this case, we are creating a consumer, and we're going to um, subscribe to the URL that has the, the endpoint from our Spring API. And what we are doing, we're just parsing the information because it comes in a JSON format. And with that, we are creating an observable. So our code in Angular, because everything is reactive in Angular, uh, we're going to be able to subscribe to these event source as well. So we are transforming the stream that comes from Spring into an observable in our XJS, so Angular is able to consume that information. Make sense? Okay. And, um, and with this, our client will be able to tell our server, okay, okay, hold on, I'm, I'm still processing the data you sent before, hold a little bit, or okay, I'm good, send me more data that I'm able to consume. So if, if you don't need to use, if you, if you, if you need to um, develop a very simple application with Angular, you can use all of that. However, we can go to the extra step and uh, add a little bit more complexity to our code. Um, and the, the Spring, uh, Spring Reactive is based on WebFlux. Um, if you know a little bit of React, which is another uh, library as well, a JavaScript library, um, usually whenever we are working with React, we also need some sort of data management. So we have to manage where the data is coming from, where is it going, who needs to consume that data, and, um, and what not. And in Angular, Angular already provides services, so very similar. We have our controllers, which will be our components. We can also have services so we can organize a little bit better the business logic that we have in our client as well. Um, but sometimes it's a little bit more complicated. Imagine Facebook, for example. You have your timeline, you have your chat, you have your not notifications. You have all of those different elements in a single screen, and they are not communicating with each other. They are independent. But whenever someone, for example, likes your picture, you're going to get a notification and you still have your timeline. Your timeline will be the way that it was. But there is something else happening. When we have that much complexity on, on the UI, we need something a little bit more powerful to manage all the information. As I mentioned, where is the information coming from? Where is it going? So we can also apply the Redux pattern in Angular as well. So we basically have a view. The view is going to um, send a request. Hey, I need this data. Please send me the list of products. And when we do that, we're going to dispatch, an, dispatch uh, an action, which is get list of products. Um, and then when this action is dispatched, we're going to go to the single source of data or, or the single source of truth, which is the store. The store has a special function that is called the reducer. Uh, so the reducer will, uh, will get the action. So what's the action that you need? Okay, I need to get all the list of products. And then the reducer will return the information that you need that is available on the store. And this is what we call the state. Uh, and then on the state, we're going to return it to the view. And one thing that is really cool about this is the component is going to initiate the change. So sometimes, uh, when, when a component needs some information, and then from that information, you need to notify other components as well. So one screen or, an, or one component that is available on the screen needs to notify the other component. This component needs, needs to notify the other one, and so on. And, and uh, all of a sudden, you have a little bit of a mess, and then you might have um, uh, concurrency problems and a lot of other headaches that we don't want. When we use Redux, we have the state, we have the store, and the component is gonna notify the state, hey, I need something, and then the state is updated and the state is gonna notify all of the components. And this is also the publisher and the, the consumer pattern. In this case, the state, the store, is going to be the publisher, and all the components, all the, the UI, all the, the different UIs that we have are going to be notified, will be consuming the data 
So it's kind of in a way uh, using the flux, the redux, which is a special kind of flux uh, in the UI as well. And the same thing, you just patch the action, store will be notified, and then all the components will subscribe to the store. And this is done with a special library that we call NGRX, the NG for Angular, and RX because it's powered by RxJS. And this is really cool whenever you are programming with it because this is, this is beautiful, this is awesome. It's so much, uh, at least I have so much fun whenever I'm using it. Again, just another diagram uh, just to show you how it works. Um, show me the code. Just give me one little second because I forgot to open. <laughs> okay, this is the shopping cart. Is everyone able to see the screen? Is it too dark or, or is it okay? Okay. Um, so here this is uh, the Angular code that we have. And again, in, as in Java, whenever we are creating, for example, a Maven project, we have a project structure as well. So we have our services. This is the one that I showed you um, that we consume the event source. And next, for example, we also have the products. We have the containers, which is the list of the products. We also have the model, which is just uh, an interface in TypeScript, which is mapped to our model in Java. We also have the services. This is gonna be um, the, um, all the Ajax calls that we are gonna use for create, update, and remove. If you want to, you're also gonna be able to run this code uh, locally if you want to. And then we have the store. So we have to define our state. For example, is it loading? Do we have any selected product? Did we click on a product? Do we have an error to show to the user? Everything is gonna be reactive, even the error messages that we show. Um, what are the products that we are displaying? Is there any search query? Are we typing something that we need to search for? Um, in NGRX, we also have an adapter, which is basically gonna create uh, methods for us, not, not gonna create, but it's gonna be available for us to use for all the basic CRUD operations as well. And of course, we also have to initiate the state. So whenever I load the application, what is the state? Of course, the products will be empty, I'm gonna be loading the products, uh, I'm not gonna have any errors, and the search query will be empty. Um, next, we have the reducers. So this is the special function that I told you about, and whenever we need something, we're gonna go to this function, and this function is gonna return uh, whatever we need. So if we're loading, we're gonna get the is loading is true, we haven't loaded the products yet, we don't have any errors, and then we're also gonna assign um, the, for the success. For the success, we're gonna get the payload that we have received uh, from Spring, and we're gonna add. So as, as I mentioned, in the adapter we have the add many, as one, update one, remove one, so we basically have uh, CRUD operations as well. And um, for, the, for the Redux, one thing that is really interesting is that it works as is what only what matters, it's only the information that we have in memory. Whenever we need to do an Ajax call or get the data from our API, the Redux doesn't care because it's something that it's outside the, the state management. So this is what we call effects or side effect <coughs> excuse me, or side effects. So when we do Ajax calls, for example, <laughs> we're gonna need to call, uh, we're gonna need to treat this independently of the application. And again, this is a code that I just love to write. So beautiful, like a lot of functional programming going on. Uh, so we do the load, again, we manage the information, we're gonna transform the information and get all the, the list or the flux of products and we're gonna dispatch a su success action. And again, when we do this, we go back to this diagram 
right here. So we have the action that is dispatched, we have the reducer that's gonna update the store, and then the store is gonna notify the component. And the way the component is notified is of course uh, through RxJS. So if we take a look here at the uh, containers, We have everything is an observable is loading the list of products. So we have an array of products if there is any error or not. So whenever we initialize the component, we're gonna dispatch all the information. And because these are observables, uh, we'll, we will be subscribing to the source of information. And this basically happens here on the template. So let me get here. So in, in Angular, we do that by evoking the observable, which is the source of information, and using the asynchronous pipe. So this is gonna be able to subscribe the information, and whenever we destroy this component, it's also gonna destroy the observable. Because one thing we also need to keep in mind whenever we are working with a lot of reactive programming we are subscribing to a lot of sources, a lot of publishers, and if we don't need to subscribe to that, to that publisher anymore, to that source anymore, we need to unsubscribe, because otherwise we can also get memory issues. You don't want uh, that publisher just uh, being in your, in your memory, just doing nothing. You want something that is active. So whenever we don't need it, we need to unsubscribe, and by using the async pipe, Angular is going to unsubscribe automatically for us. At the beginning of the session, um, so that's it for, for Angular as well. And um, one, one thing that I would also like to share with you is at the beginning of the session, I mentioned that for this particular example, I was gonna use MongoDB. And right after the Spring Reactive was released, um, we, we could also only use MongoDB because MongoDB as a non-relational database has an asynchronous dri driver by default. Um, however, if we need to connect, for example, to an Oracle database, the current driver that we use to connect with JDBC is synchronous. But there is this other project as well that is uh, in progress and gets even more uh, functionalities every day that is called the R2DBC. So instead of using JDBC, we'll use the R2DBC and we'll be able to connect asynchronously with the database. Because it doesn't matter, if, if you use, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, the, J, uh, the, the JPA repository uh, connecting to an Oracle database synchronously, it doesn't matter if you're using Spring Reactive or not. All your code will be uh, synchronous, asynchronous, but then when you go to the database, it's gonna be synchronous, so it's gonna break all the asynchronous flow that we have going on. So it's also important to use the right tool to connect to your database as well, so you don't break that asynchronous flow. And especially when we are working with a lot of reactive programming, um, and we use the operators from our XJava or our XJS, for example, um, it might be for some people, some people might think that it's a little bit simpler to read the code or even to code it, and, and um, we start, um, we stop coding in a more um, non-functional way, in an imperative way, and we start coding a little bit more in functional programming as well. Um, and one of the challenges that we have as we as uh, programmers, we need to write code, of course, but in some cases we also need to debug code, being to fix a bug or find what's wrong with our code, or even to try to understand the code better as well. I, I usually use debugging to try to understand each step that the, what the code is doing, especially if, if I'm uh, new to a product, uh, project and I need to, to learn a little bit more what, it, what it's doing. And one of the challenges that we have with all this reactive design, reactive programming, is debugging. So we still have some uh, ways to, to go until we reach a very mature, um, mature tool that we will be able to use and debug our code in the same way that we do with our imperative code nowadays. So this is something just to keep in mind as well. Well, that's it. Um, you will be able to get the source code for the Spring code and also Angular code 
in this repository, if you like. I'll also be sharing on Twitter uh, the slides as well, in case you like to, to have the slides and download it. These are also some references in case you like to study a little bit more about uh, reactive spring and also reactive streams, the NGRX, and also uh, some patterns and techniques so you can have a full reactive design, meaning back end, front end, all, all together. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you have enjoyed the session. In case you have any questions, I'll be here uh, at the conference, but you can also reach me in the in social media as well. Thank you. <laughs>